Toxin Psychoanalysis shares topics published in the IPA Society journals and Congress debates worldwide, from the direct voice of the authors to the links to their papers. We hope that this window will allow you to see the depth and breadth of psychoanalytic thought across the world. Far away, so close. Happy listening! This episode was created and edited by Gaetano Pellegrini. Introduction recorded by Frank and Dre. On this episode, Talks on Psychoanalysis hosts an interview with William Glover, president of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He will talk with Anna Christopoulos, member of the IPA website editorial board, just a few days after the end of the 109th annual APSA meeting. This interview will offer us the opportunity to have an in-depth view on the current social and political situation in the United States from the perspective of the psychoanalytical frame. Dr. William C. Glover is president of the American Psychoanalytic Association and served as North American member of the IPA Board of Representatives 2009, 2011, and 2015, 2019. He's a training and supervising analyst at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis and lives and practices in Berkeley, California. Anna L. Chrysopoulos is a member and the General Secretary of the Hellenic Psychoanalytic Society in Athens, Greece. She's Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, Greece. It's good to see you, Bill, on the other side of the world, an ocean and a continent away. Good to see you, Anna. We're old friends from training days, so we've seen each other periodically in meetings and had a chance to visit. So it's wonderful to see you here. And, and that's one of the things about um, modern technology and the International Psychoanalytic Association is we can connect and it really helps. It really does. I was thinking too, how many years um, have we known each other? And here we are again, talking um, about things that yeah. are very important. Um, I think that you have been faced with some very significant challenges uh, since assuming the presidency of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And I'm referring to the, the COVID-19 and also the more recent socio-political challenges. So yes, yes. Well, I became president in February and our good friend, Lee Jaffe, whom you also know well, Uh, preceded me as president. He had to step down a bit early due to health. He sends his greetings. I spoke to him just the other day. He's doing, doing well. Um, and so it's been an incredible um, time. Uh, those things are, are happening, cascading uh, events, uh, catastrophes, uh, the pandemic, uh, and uh, well, the situation before that politically was so difficult as well. So it's been an incredible time. And uh, an honor and a challenge uh, to be president of uh, the association at this time, yeah. Let me begin by asking you, first of all, about uh, the, the virus situation. Um, because of course, there's been a lot of uh, talk and a lot of writing, a lot of people talking about the psychological effects. But I wonder whether you could say uh, something about how you see the situation, how you think from a psychoanalytic perspective, how the situation has impacted on people, um, especially in the United States. Sure, well, it's just erupted. Uh, it's, you know, as I said before, it's been a catastrophe, uh, you know, that's affected everybody, um, you know, um, but unevenly as, as it's go, gone through society, some populations are more vulnerable, but it's been, Oh, we just had a, uh, a virtual meeting of the American Psychoanalytic last weekend. We had planned to meet in person and we had to turn at the last minute and put it on online. And it, it, it turned out to, to work well. Um, and what we were talking about, how the world seems broken. Uh, things are overturned. Um, our normal you know, ways of relating and the, uh, the comfort, you know, the security we find in the world, all that's shaken even though many of us are not personally experiencing the illness or even know anybody directly who's, who's ill, still it's this, you know, the uh, uh, 
sheltering in place, the, the, the confinement of the quarantine, uh, trying to uh, protect ourselves and, and others. You know, everyone, it just feels like this uh, uh, anxiety and, and uncertainty. And of course, treatments, you know, uh, are interrupted and the whole uh, world has gone, to, gone online in, in psychoanalysis as well. It's just, it's just been a huge uh, experiment. Some people who are, have some experience with it and have helped us, but it's for all of us, it's been a huge, huge experiment. You know, the word that often comes to mind is the word trauma. And I wonder whether you think, you know, that it's been traumatic for everyone, but also for psychoanalysts dealing with the kind of fear and uncertainty um, as well as, you know, all the changes in, in daily life and, and in practice. Yes, of course. Um, we've been fortunate that we've been able to turn to uh, to work remotely. So we're able to keep working. Uh, and most people find their practices are, uh, patients are coming and, and, and want to continue the treatments. So we have something to do um, despite the pandemic and the quarantines. So that's a... a positive thing for us, but we're experiencing the same anxiety. So as you know, many people, when you agree to patient, if it's the how are you is uh, kind of automatic and it's mutual. And we're called upon to respond because the, the people want to know that we are literally okay um, because there's this life-threatening illness uh, that's going going amongst yeah, us. Yes, especially we're taking on a completely new meaning. Um, yes, yeah. I wonder whether you can say a little more about some of the more specific um, effects that you think this has had um, on the psychic functioning of people. Um, you know, we talk about trauma and anxiety, but um, I imagine that there are things that you've thought about and that you hear about in terms of these issues. Well, of course, it's all depend on the individual psychology, but everyone, I think, is just this sort of baseline of anxiety that the ground is uncertain. Our normal routines uh, are, are disturbed. Even those folks who are in denial of it and are carrying on as though uh, it, it was fine, that, that too has a, a, you know, a, an aspect to it, the manic kind of denial that we see. But many people are depressed, anxious, uh, feeling unrooted. Um, there's a kind of a very primitive level, even in, even amongst all of us. And, and uh, one of the things that we've done, of course, is to try and help each other uh, in this crisis. So when the, uh, the American, we decided what to do, well, the first thing we need to help our members, help their patients and the broader public. Um, and that's uh, something we've been able to do, I think, do pretty well, because we had some people who were very experienced at working online. They were able to train others. So we've offered a lot of that. We've also offered resources for the public in you know, different kinds and also uh, pro bono services for frontline healthcare providers has been a thing that a number of our institutes have done, trying to, to offer what we can uh, to the, to the public as well as help ourselves and our, our members. Uh, it's been an incredible kind of coming together in a way, and that's been a heartening aspect of it uh, because we need each other in this time. Yeah, uh, there is talk about how, you know, in all of this very, very difficult and dark time, there have been some positive things that have emerged. And I think this kind of coalescing and feeling the need yeah. to, you know, has been very um, positive and very important. Um, let me ask you, obviously the whole world, the whole psychoanalytic world has been impacted in this, um, in this uh, COVID-19 situation. Do you think that, that um, the United States and North America has been um, uh, impacted in any different kinds of ways than the rest of the world? You know, I was thinking about this. I think it's been an awakening for us. And this sort of, you know, turns towards the social unrest that's happening in the States because already before COVID came, we had this very difficult po political situation where we made a hard turn to the right and the, the Trump presidency. Uh, you know, I was thinking about America, you know, and uh, our image used to be uh, the Statue of Liberty, um, you know, and, and which was a, a gift from the French people, uh, to the United States, and there's that 
wonderful poem, you know, by uh, Emma Lazarus that, you know, the lines are, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And, you know, um, that's aspirational, you know, that we've never been able to fully achieve that, but we have, a, we have tried. But now it seems like the image of, of the United States is, the, is Trump's wall, that we're not, you know, inviting in the poor, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the yearning, the huddled masses. We're keeping them out. We're deporting them. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been horrible here. And um, one of the things that my association has done is try to do all we can to take positions or advocate against this the, the mistreatment of, of immigrants, the horrible uh, the confinement of, of children, those sorts of things. And there's sort of been, a, 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 it's always been president a present in psychoanalysis, as you know, a, a social orientation. And that's, uh, um, we've been called to that again, to renew that in, in these times. So, um, you know, the other thing I wanted to say just about I, the poem, I didn't re re realize it, but it has the, the line, yearning to breathe free. And so then we go to, uh, in this time, to George Floyd uh, and that image um, because there he is with, with the, uh, the oppressor on his neck, knee on the neck, he, and he can't breathe. He cannot breathe. Uh, he's crying out to his mother, his mama. And I think that cut through everyone's uh, denial. And also it relates to the COVID because it's, it's, it's a, COVID is a respiratory illness that, you know, people cannot breathe. They, 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 they you know, that's how people die in a similar way to, to George Floyd. And I think that, you know, if people have thought about this, you know, sort of that sort of uh, that uprising, that upwelling, which seemed to reach beyond the usual progressive liberal, you know, people have been working about on racism and reach a much broader swath of the country in a way that we seem to ready. You know, and it, it reminds somebody was telling me that how many uh, uprisings it took before they overthrew, uh, they stormed the Bastille. You know, uh, change in society often takes a lot of efforts before you get there. So our hope is that maybe this time we can be uh, more persistent and really make a change on the social uh, in terms of dealing with racism in, in, in the United States. And, uh, you know, the fault lines that have been exposed uh, uh, in the pandemic, you know, in some sense, every, we're all vulnerable to it, but some more than others. And people, poor people, uh, racial minorities, particularly the black population, the Latino population, the front, the people who can't afford to, you know, to, uh, to work from home. I mean, their jobs require that they take the bus or whatever. I mean, it just really showed um, uh, a rip in the social fabric. It has been exposed, and then we saw the uh, the, the outpouring into the streets, um, and that too is you know if you think about it psychoanalytically, when there's a, a big loss, a trauma, there is a depression, uh, there is the melancholia, uh, but then there is the coming back of life, um, and I think in some sense that sort of fueled the uprising as well, and people willing to go out in the streets and demonstrate. Uh, despite the risk to themselves. So listening to you, um, I'm thinking that in a way, it sounds as if you think of it as a kind of, of a, an outbreak of a symptom from something that was already brewing and in process for a while. Um, uh, do you think that things had been kind of taking a certain kind of... Uh, uh, line things had been moving along in a certain kind of way, and then erupted um, with this event. Well, it's been you know I was thinking about cascading catastrophes. I mean you know the political catastrophe that I, many of us regard what's happened the turn to the right, the searching for a strong man to make us feel secure, that sort of thing. Then there's the pandemic, which you know cuts across it. No wall will defeat the pandemic. It points out to us our interconnectedness and the folly of the isolationist kind of movements, you know, and we, uh, we have to work together. 
But then it also uh, it exposed, you know, uh, so there was the pandemic of, of the virus, but also the pandemic of anxieties around the, the virus, but other social ills are manifest. I mean, we, is this just the first of other calamities that are gonna befall us with global warming, et cetera? Uh, I mean, is this a harbinger of, of things to come? So it's, it's very frightening. And, and then on top of that, it, you know, but, uh, the other plague in America has been racism. And our nation began, you know, slavery was here from the beginning, 400 years ago. And there's been a very, lots of effort. There's been a podcast about, about that. There's been very moving, just tracing how the nation has been built and its wealth has a lot of, uh, has to do with slavery. And in the South mainly, of course, but the North complicit, the banks in the North benefited from the, from the system as well as the plantation owners in the South. And we certainly have made progress, um, but Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation 157 years ago, I mean, the promise of that has still not been realized. And, you know, it's been, oh, in my lifetime, you know, certainly and in, in before, there've been episodic uprisings of uh, for civil rights, uh, and you know numbers of numbers of times, and we have made progress, but then it recedes because uh, it's so uh, interwoven in our society. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is just about uh, white complicity. Even folks, you know, like myself, um, you know, um, a white liberal. I live in Berkeley, California. I'm talking to you from Berkeley, California now, m- one of the more liberal towns in the United States. And even here, um, you know, just our ways of thinking, there's a sort of systemic racism in the system. Even when it's not overt, it, it very much influences things. And so we need to, to, to examine that more closely. And, you know, there's an increasing feeling of, within the American psychoanalytic to do that, uh, to, be, to take a more persistent, a more uh, consistent uh, effort to address this in ourselves, in our institutions, and in, and in society. Uh, and because we've been a very wide uh, organization, we have oh, 3,000 members, but uh, a dozen or so are, are, are African American. Other minorities are underrepresented. Um, in one of the talks the other day, somebody referred to us as a kind of a gated community. And, and, and we say we want to have minorities, but then we, have we, how do we make ourselves accessible to them? and uh, make psychoanalysis, as it always has been, more than just a, a, a private practice. Um, yes, because it is one of the myths that is commonly uh, kind of ascribed to psychoanalysis, that it's uh, really for the affluent and the elite and so on and so forth. Um, but in fact, Freud's whole idea was that it should be um, you know, available at a community level, and that's why he had the ambulatorium originally. Um, the free now, clinics, you mean? Yeah, I think that, that there was the idea that it, that it should not be just restricted um, to people uh, that were, you know, privileged, uh, yeah. either yeah. intellectually or financially. Now, of course, uh, you know, you're, you're right, I think, in that um, it has been sort of shocking to the world to see what's been happening in the United States. Um, both in terms of the virus and in terms of the kind of growing unrest and all the political situation. Um, And certainly, you know, the U.S. has its own history and its own um, kind of identity. But I wonder whether uh, you see similarities between the situation, especially the social political situation in the United States and the social political situation in the rest of the world in certain ways. Sure, well, we see that, that there's the uh, you know, various kind of governments moving towards autocratic you know, uh, governments, uh, certainly leaders with those inclinations in Brazil, in Turkey, other places. We see Brexit, you know, in, in England, we see the kind of isolationist movements in various places and, and, and we see what happens in Russia. Uh, so we're very concerned about that and this sort of putting up of walls and breaking ties and, you know, um, going you know, America great again, you know, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's frightening because it's, it's very apparent to me that we need global cooperation. And uh, uh, 
to face the challenges that that that, uh, that we see. But in terms of psychoanalysis, I mean, I think America is this, and as you were saying, it's also always been there. Um, the, the focus on the social. There's been the Freudian left um, and the Frankfurt School, um, and different. Individuals have pursued that in more or less. I mean, there's been a tradition of free clinics and, and low fee clinics in the states. Also, in, in more recently, there's been a real effort towards uh, psychoanalysis in the community, and we were talking about that as, as making it part of training. And actually, one uh, institute, the uh, Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California, that's here in San Francisco. It's an independent institute; it's not part of APSA. Has um, a training track so that uh, candidates can, one of their cases, so they have three cases for their training, one of their cases can be a service in the community, not necessarily one-on-one -on -one with, with a patient, but, but, but some kind of a, a psychoanalytically focused work uh, in the community, and they're making it part of their training. And I think other people are, are interested in that as a way of encouraging our, and rewarding our involvement in the community um, not just have it be uh, for those individuals who are so inclined, you know, um, to make it more uh, part of what we do, because uh, we have a lot to offer on those levels too, as as, as you know. Yeah. Do you see this community um, outreach and involvement in the community as something that is um, that is a change from the past um, it, within the American? Um, it's reason. always been there, but it but it hasn't been a, 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 a focus. It's always been applied psychoanalysis, who just sort of thought of as lesser than or not the real, uh, the heart of what we do. Uh, to make it part of training is a big step. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of focus in the American psychoanalytic in all oh, the past decade or more about socially oriented programs and focus on you know uh, working with children and community school violence bullying, those sorts of things. There's also a lot of work with uh, um, um, working with LGBTQ population and openness. That was a whole uh, change uh, within American psychoanalysis. That's now been well established, uh, but that's been a, an ongoing concern of ours. So when you, when, when you think about the global situation and the similarities in, in all the world in terms of these uh, social political uh, developments. Do you have um, any? How do you understand this? Uh, these kind of developments from a psychoanalytic point of view. What do you think has uh, led to these situations now? Well, it's like and else is, uh, go ahead. And it's a difficult question. It's a complicated question. And but you know, I, I am interested in hearing your thoughts about it. Well, I think psychoanalysis has always been a movement. A broad movement, you know, that has, has you know, it's it's uh, in the society. I mean, even though there's a lot of critique of Freud and psychoanalysis, everyone is in, influenced by it. All of therapy is is Freudian based, I mean, you know, except the most Skinnerian kind of, you know. But yeah. all the talk therapies are Freudian based. But it's 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 not just a an elite private practice uh, psychoanalysis. It's, it's been a popular movement. And the association, my association and the other ones in the world and the IPA certainly have been professional uh, education and membership organizations, you know, which you could think of in a way as a guild, you know, which I don't mean pejoratively. I mean, guilds are valid. That's a valid kind of structure to have to protect and, and, and uh, promote a certain craft or in, our, in, our, in our case, a, uh, a profession of healing. But it's also been a broad social movement, and a lot of people have contributed to that. And I think that uh, um, certainly uh, APSA has pivoted in that direction. And these events, the pandemic, you know, what happened for us, it was sort of spontaneous. We thought we've got to do something uh, for our members and for the public. And so we did it as broadly as we could. And one of the first things we did was to, to help the providers so that they would know how to provide services online. So we mobilized that quickly and we opened up to any licensed mental health person. Didn't, for no, you know, it was pro bono, the trainings we offered. And we've had, uh, one of the things we established was uh, peer consulting groups where one of our members volunteered to be a, a moderator, not, not a teacher, 
uh, and people, you know, we have we have 30 of them going, uh, which is a, about 250, 300 people, um, most of whom are not members of APSA. Uh, and they've been going for a while now and, and have been very well received. Um, so we've been doing things like that. And it was just, you know, we have town halls where we meet uh, every two weeks just for an hour. And, and we're going to have the eighth one uh, on Sunday. It's been 16 weeks. But I think back to the first ones, it's like, you know, if I would look at the, you know, we had a recording. We don't record them now because it's, it's not the right setting. But we did make a recording of the first one. And it would be like a time capsule. I mean, how much change has occurred in that period of time from the kind of, we were still hoping, you know, we could have our, you know, we didn't know what was happening. All the uncertainty we've all been dealing with, trying to make a place we can come together. And those have been well received. The attendance has varied, but we've spoken to, the, tried to speak to the moment. In the last couple of times at our town halls, uh, they're attended often by several hundred people. We focus shifted to uh, talking about race and, and, and addressing racism in, uh, in, uh, in the states. But that's been a thing we've done. So that sort of, it was like, you know, it, I mean, I mean, it wasn't like you know, a lot of deliberation. Should we do this and not do this? It was like, oh, of course we should do this. Um, and what to do, we had to figure out. But it was very clear we wanted to reach out uh, and not re restrict our efforts just to our members. How do you see things um, developing in the future? Of course, you know, it's hard to say because of we're all living in an age of uncertainty, but I wonder whether you've um, uh, discussed uh, about future um, contributions or trends for psychoanalysts in the U.S., given the situation as it is now? What do you think will be the future challenges? Well, there are a lot. I mean, we had challenges going in because we're an, an aging, you know, uh, association, aging profession. We have trouble being accessible because it takes so much to be eligible for training and to be able to afford to do it. So we have to make you know, ourselves accessible and relevant. And we've been trying to do that. We've been making some good steps, but this sort of calls for it in a very urgent way. Um, and we're, we're looking towards, you know, uh, reaching out to psychotherapists. You know, there's only 3,000 members of the American Psychoanalytic and probably another thousand uh, or so people in the, in the IPA institutes within the states. But there are 30 or 40,000 psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapists or, uh, of, of different you know, orientations. But broadly speaking, there's a lot. So, uh, and, and I think we, are, we're, we want to uh, make stronger alliances with those groups. Exactly how we'll do it, we don't know. But we see it as a movement, and we do need to do a better job of contesting the cognitive behavioral um, sort of dominance of uh, in mental health thinking in terms of policy and best practices, that evidence-based medicine, that sort of thing. We have good research on, on the psychoanalytic side that our treatments are equally effective and in some, some ways maybe have more enduring effects than the briefer CBT oriented treatments. And we have not done a good job of, you know, uh, advocating for ourselves and making that, that research known. So we need to do that. And we need to do that in alliance with others who may be, not be psychoanalysts, but use psychoanalytic thinking in their, in their work uh, as psychotherapists or uh, at clinics and, and, and working with groups uh, as well. Uh, so that's, a, a, I think, something that's really uh, important. Uh, going forward, yeah. and I don't know about the. I think in the rest of the world, I know that in, that the current IPA administration, psychoanalysis in the community has been a big focus, uh, and I think it's you know in different ways in different places. But I know it's. It, I think that is universal. Um, what's your experience of it in, in uh, our observation from from Europe, Anna? My sense is that there is a, a, a concerted effort, both in terms of uh, outreach to the community and involvement in the community. And I think that in many uh, countries, there has been an, an outreach with the COVID situation, similar to that uh, of the United States, trying to help other professionals offering 
um, uh, free, um, you know, support and uh, brief therapy to people on frontline um, right, health right. Uh, administration and, uh, and uh, uh, medical workers. Um, and I think also with the research, there is, there's a big argument, of course, about research. Um, as to whether empirical research is really psychoanalytic or not. That's a big sort of scientific controversy. But I think that, the, that there is the sense that evidence-based research, since it is being done, needs to be known um, because there are, as you say, results that are very much in support of, um, of psychoanalytic treatments um, in very sophisticated kinds of uh, of, um, well, yeah, I'm not very familiar with it myself, but there's a, it, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in neuropsychoanalysis and the findings there that, that the Freud scientific project may be realizable in terms of the uh, biological you know, in, uh, underpinnings of, of uh, psychology. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, it's an exciting time there. And we, you know, and I think APSA has been oriented towards supporting research and uh, we do think it's valid. Um, yeah. Now, speaking of other regions, how do you see the collaboration of APSA um, with the other parts of the IPA world? Well, you know, now, I've been thinking. Is- yeah, I've been thinking about that, and it's sort of the other thing that's this whole situation has made me think about is our collaboration internationally. And I've realized that, you know, in terms of dealing with racial issues in the states, I've been on the sidelines these past few years. Mainly, you know, I've been op- occupied with psychoanalytic politics, which are necessary. You know, we need to work out our differences, et cetera. But it does put it in perspective what what the world is going through, and we have been, I think, too preoccupied with these, you know, internal kind of struggles. And we think about what's going on in the world and and how we can help. I think that that does help us, I, you know, me, sort of re-examine those things. And I think uh, it will affect APSA's relationship with the IPA going forward in, in a good way. Uh, and we'll work more closely together. You know, I was interested, um, I had an exchange of correspondence with Alain Gibault, who's the uh, a director of training at the Paris Society. And just some of the things he was, they have done very similar things, large groups meeting by Zoom to talk about the work and how to, how to, how to provide services in this time, similar kinds of concerns. And he attended our conference and we had a, some exchange about it. So that was an example. And I know it's going on everywhere. I mean, and I look forward to the ability to communicate um, with people and, and it's such a loss not to be able to see each other in person, um, but, you know, but to see each other like this and in bigger gatherings, uh, uh, I think is great. And we're seeing the potential of it, you know, uh, how we could do that. We could, you know, the social distancing um, um, is a misnomer. It's physical distancing. And we can, you know, connect. It's not the same, but, you know, I don't mean to blur and say that, you know, online stuff is just as, is the same or as good, but it is uh, a way to connect, and not just for treatment, but for uh, our associations um, and for our community work as well. So one of the things that people uh, talk about in terms of uh, the various um, situations, both the the virus pandemic situation and also political uh, changes is that although it's very trying, uh, they, and they talk about positive things they've discovered about themselves, about their lives, about the world. Um, Yeah. What what positive aspects do you think um, have come out of this for um, the psychoanalytic community and for psychoanalysts, both in terms of their thinking and in terms of how they can best serve their uh, communities and um, and patients? Well, I, I've been saying this all along. I think it's the turn to the social. I mean, a, a, and a reinvigorating of the, the social uh, focus of psychoanalysis in terms of community work, in terms of broadening our appeal uh, to other mental health professionals, in terms of, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on, we have now podcasts and we're on Twitter and we're on Facebook 
and I can't keep up with it because I'm not adept at those technologies, but we want to reach people who do use those technologies and, and we're doing it. We have a blog that's uh, just got a, just recently uh, had a million hits it's had. It's been linked with psychology today and uh, that was a bit of a landmark for us. Um, so we're trying to be out there in, in, in a way that's different than just uh, come to see us in our offices, you know, and which ends up where we become kind of a, uh, an elite, a bit of a boutique, you know, kind of treatment and perspective where psychoanalysis has so much to offer culture and has been, you know, so much of our, uh, um, our insights have been uh, adopted, uh, become commonplace, you know, uh, but we still have, have more to more to offer in terms of making meaning out of what's what's happening and helping helping the world deal with this broken condition we're in, and providing not refuge in in help for not just the individuals who can come to see us whom we're able to reach personally, but but something broader than that, uh, which is what we we aspire to do and. and uh, have a commitment to continuing. And it sounds as if it sounds as if you have been doing it. I mean, you know, within the United States, that there has been a, a very uh, strong effort that's been very successful in terms of reaching various segments of the population, and as you say, not just patients on the couch or um, across the room. You know, it's exhilarating. Early on in this, I mean, I was never been so happy to go to a committee meeting as, as when I go to a Zoom and see some familiar faces, you know, talking about things. And, and uh, that, you know, that, that continues, although there's a lot of Zoom meetings now, so it's, the effect is not so dramatic. But, you know, seeing a, you know, like this conference we had, we had 800 people. So some of the uh, meetings we had webinars, so you don't see everybody. Other meetings we had, the other Zoom connection where you can see different panels, gallery view, we, we can have 10 pages of people. Now, that can be a little distracting, but just to scroll through and see the different faces, you know, it, it is, you know, give you a sense of uh, solidarity and community that is that is strengthening uh, and, and helps, you know, because the connection, um, as well as the insight and understanding, you know. And the other thing I have to, uh, you know, want to just say is a lot of what we're going to do is going to be dealing with the outbreak coup, you know, the after, the, after the blow. Um, I mean, you know, we're just dealing with the tr- we're treating the trauma a lot not now, but the effects even after we get past the, the pandemic. Uh, and there's also there's a lot of longing, you know. We're talking about returning to the office. Uh, resuming life as before, but how will it, how can it be the same? I mean, I think this thing has shaped the world in a way, shaken it, that we're not going to be able to return as it was before. That's kind of a fantasy. Um, and we see people who are, you know, want to deny that there's that much danger. I mean, that has a psychotic level of denial to it, uh, manic uh, thing going on that's, that's so dangerous. And that's one of the things that's happening in the States that now, I mean, I'm just reading that Europe may not allow um, visitors from the States because our, our containment of the virus has not been so good. So it, it's been, you know, uh, um, a failure in a large ways in the States to deal with this effectively, whereas other places have been able to deal with it more effectively. And, uh, you know, there's this sort of what I regard, regard as a false binary between the economy and uh, treating, uh, protecting ourselves from the illness. Uh, I, I don't think it has to be that way. You see places that are able to do it. Um, I've been talking with somebody regularly from South Korea, um, consultation, and, and she's just been telling me how they've done it. And, and for a while, they did not see anybody who was actively sick, but they would see other people in the offices with masks. And they had all that testing and the contact tracing and all of that. And it hasn't been, you know, made them you know, immune, but they've really done a, a good job and without as much damage to their, to their economy. And uh, we need to emulate that here. Uh, and, and we haven't done such a good job of it. Um, but, you know, uh, we need to keep working at it. Um, but I digress here a little bit, so. Yeah. No, but I actually yeah. think that, that this, what you bring up now, the idea of, um, uh, of denial and the, and the sense that, you know, I mean, 
we are hearing this trend more recently of people saying there is no virus or it's really all grossly exaggerated. And that's kind of a new phenomenon that's growing in momentum in many parts of the world. Um, and I don't know whether that is just a, uh, you know, a, a reaction uh, to uh, the uncertainty, as, as you say, a really kind of very immature, very kind of hopeless kind of defensive reaction. Uh, well, it's it's a it, it's frightening, chilling how they've been so willing to. I mean, the the uh, the most casualties, the most deaths are in the vulnerable populations, the elderly in nursing homes, the incarcerated, people who have to work in uh, tight quarters and meatpacking plants, poor people. I mean, and we seem to be willing uh, to to let that happen in a way that that's very chilling, or some people at least are willing. Uh, to do that, and it seems that that seems very cold, and you know, very uh, uh, a primitive retreat into a well paranoid schizoid position, if, to use technical language, of people just so frightened they become survivalists and willing to sacrifice others. You know, I think that you bring up a very important point, which is how it impacts um, on the psyche of the average citizen. When, you know, what there is, this, as you say, this kind of um, binary presentation of the situation that, you know, on the one hand, there is this dangerous virus, but on the other hand, if things are done in a certain way, then the economy will collapse. And I think that the presentation of this binary um, mm -hmm. dilemma uh, also um, may be impacting on people's psyches in a very kind of important way. Right, and taking very partisan positions. And I was, it was talking about the kind of a, the return, you know, that, you know, the world is not gonna be the same, psychoanalysis is not gonna be the same, but we also know the power of denial and repression. And there is an, the risk that we'll get past this pandemic and then it'll be, oh, whew, oh that's gone. I mean, we, we saw those other, the SARS, uh, Ebola, I mean, they were warnings you know, of things that could have gone, you know, been worse earlier that we've basically, oh, we've been sort of for a year or so and then things die down. And the same thing with dealing with racism in the States. Um, will this just be a moment? Will there be a flurry of activity or will there be ongoing change? And that that's uh, that's that's our dilemma to see, you know, that the forces of repression and, and, and denial won't set in and we'll deny the pandemic or we'll, we'll sort of settle back down and say, in, 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 and continue to collude in, in various ways with, with racism uh, in, uh, in the structure of our society. So that's a challenge. Yeah, one of the other things that, that um, we often hear uh, are people saying, our patients and, and people in our everyday lives, that the, uh, the pandemic really made them um, reevaluate what is important and what is not and give emphasis to more internal kinds of, um, of um, processes and, and you know, feelings, emotions, um, uh, relationships with other people, having time, that there's been a reassessment um, and a reevaluation of, of how they want to live their lives. And that stock taking is considered something that's been a positive kind of outcome. Mm -hmm from all of this, and I don't know how you hear that. Well, I do, I, I hear that, what re reminds me of, a, a lot of my patients have sort of gotten really serious about the work. I mean, not that they weren't before, but there's now kind of a, with, with many of them, many people, there's a sort of, let's get down to business here. I mean, I don't have time to, to mess around. Um, so that's been there. And, uh, and also, you know, that we talk about the, um, the asymmetry that's necessary in, in treatment you know, that we're there to, to help the patient. And so it's mutual, but there's an asymmetry. And it's been commented on by a lot of people, there's a pull towards more symmetry um, in the relationship between the, the, the uh, therapist and the patient, the analyst and patient, which is natural. And in the sort of, how are you? Uh, and we answer in a different way than we might, you know, pre-COVID. Well, we do answer in a different way. We feel called upon to say, I'm fine, I'm okay. I'll you know, um, but people need to know that because they can't trust it because they're seeing us on the screen and, you know, it isn't the same as, you know what I mean? Feeling the, 
the vitality of the other person in the flesh. So that that's been necessary. So in that, you know, there is a, I remember it struck in my mind an earlier example of that was there was a Loma Prieta earthquake, oh, 30 years ago. And I was with a patient, uh, a, a new patient, a, a young woman, not very trustful of treatment. It was not analysis. It was, uh, I was actually in an army base and it was a young soldier who was scared, skittish. She had, I forget what the circumstances were, but we were just getting started and she was very frightened of treatment. And then the building shook, mm-hmm. you know, and we both were like this. And that moment of shared humanity and, you know, uh, standing up and deciding what to do and leaving the room, you know, kind of put us in a different level. And it changed things between us that she was able to trust me more after that. So I'm not advocating that, you know, as, as that's got to happen, but it enabled us to go further in the work than we might have otherwise. And I think there's, that's been, I've seen that happen um, with other patients. But then there's also sort of maintaining the focus. That, that we're not there for them to take care of my anxiety. And I have to watch out that so, sort of my reciprocating and my being, you know, more symmetrical with them doesn't become then a mutuality that, that takes the focus off why they're coming to see me. Um, so that's a, you know, a recalibrating uh, of um, the, the relationship. I think that a lot of us have, have been doing that. And as we do resume seeing people in person, there'll be a whole process around that too, which will be a big learning for all of us. Well, one Working of the with... things, yeah. Go ahead. You know, one of the things that's, that's often talked about in, in um, you know, uh, uh, professional uh, meetings and so forth is the fact that the frame has been really um, challenged and altered um, and, um, <laughs> you know, analysts have really had to think about how to adjust to that. So I'm wondering whether you couldn't say a few words about that aspect. We were talking a lot about that, about the frame. And, you know, the frame, it, it isn't the room and the couch and the, the setup. It, it's a, it's a, a, a media of minds uh, that you can set a frame. It's a metaphor about the two minds can come together for a particular purpose. So I began to think of it as that we have a movable setting. Um, in the sense that instead of our consulting room setup, which we, we all know, we've been able to adapt that to its virtual settings or telephone work. And, you know, it's a work in progress and an experiment for all of us. But also in the social arena, can we take our psychoanalytic thinking into that setting? For example, there's a lot of call in, in, in the States for social, for political advocacy, uh, for us to take a stronger st- a stand on what's happening politically in, in the United States. And some of us, the leadership has tended, you know, given the responsibilities to the organization, you know, and we're trying to do it. So we wanna take a psychoanalytic stance on issues that we have knowledge about that, that are in, within our scope of our expertise, like the effects uh, 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 of, of various kind of policies, immigration policies, for instance, on the population and those affected by them on the effects of uh, failures of leadership, not specifically going after specific political figures. Uh, there's been a you know, call to diagnose or to take an active stance around, uh, around our president, which some of us, you know, even though we strongly disagree with his, his, uh, his, all his actions, we think we, we should not get into the political arena, but psychoanalysis should speak to the, um, to the social impact uh, uh, and particularly the mental health impact of various actions or failures of action on the part of our leadership and governance and then be active in that way. So um, that's a way of, of being in the world differently than in the consulting room and taking a psychoanalytic way of thinking, a setting, if you will, to that situation, to speak to it, not just another voice against this, but also bring into what do we have to offer? Like for in, around racism, I mean, we know a lot about uh, unconscious bias, uh, uh, implicit bias, you know, uh, those sorts of things, projection, disavowal, denial, all these sorts of things. And we can, you know, uh, help ourselves and help others recognize the, how those forces are at play in our struggle with racism. 
One of the other um, questions that's come up specifically, you know, for analysts in terms of coping with the new sort of the changes, I would say, in the frame has been the fact that the body is the bodies are no longer in the room um, together, that um, the bodies are now at a distance. And I wonder whether you can say um, a few words about how you think that um, has impacted on the work and how it's impacted on analysts trying to um, make the best of that situation uh, without the the physical presence. Um, the well, there's you know there's a lot of concern about that, and there are different there are different views that not being in the room together kind of maybe really uh, weakens the process in a way that. It can't be comparable. Other people feel, you know, that it's, you know, um, has its own, you know, merits. So that there's a lot of uh, uh, difference and we're, we're finding out and, and I think we'll know more. Um, you know, certainly we can work and, and work effectively, but it's not the same. But for myself, I mean, you know this, I, I love jazz music, um, but there's nothing like hearing it live. You know, um, so, and so I, have you know, there's some concerts online now. And of course, you have record, uh, oodles of recorded music, but there's nothing about hearing it live uh, uh, that, that replaces that. And I, I long for the day when I can be back in a jazz club. And, and that may be a while. Um, and so we'll see how this plays out. But so I hope that this is an addition, not a replacement um, to our work, you know, working online. You know, that's the way I, I but think in way it. it's it's been unfortunate to come about in this way, but there have been um, new things that we've learned to appreciate about working in different ways and new possibilities. Mm -hmm. And we can reach more people. I mean, you know, there's the sort of the expediency part of it, but then I think treatment and, you know, it's going to be more accessible. Uh, And there's, you know, as you know, in the marketplace, there's all kinds of uh, uh, treatments available and many, you know, are pretty superficial. And I think that, you know, we can make a place for a psychoanalytic setting uh, online. Uh, this is not the same as the setting in person, but we it, you know, we can work effectively in that way. Yeah. Are there any um, specific goals that you would like to see um, in the next while, while you are president that you have specifically in mind for the American Psychoanalytic Boy, that's a that's a great question and a tall one. We've been sort of right now, it's just run from one thing to the next, which is good in a way because you don't have time to, to overthink it. But it's it, but it's, it's a weakness because you don't have a time to, to think about things, you know, uh, as fully as we might. But I do think that, you know, uh, my organization, as I said, it's been aging and, and, and we, we're at a turning point. We've, we've sort of resolved some internal struggles about training that we had. And now we're more unified. And we are turning you know, um, to the world, uh, and this these crises have, have forced us to do that. Um, but there's also opportunity in that to make ourselves more relevant to a uh, younger generation, to a more diverse population, uh, to really make ourselves accessible to people of color. And uh, that's a commitment that uh, many of us have that we're going to follow up on. Before we stop, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, in terms of um, your thoughts about uh, APSA, your thoughts about APSA and the rest of the psychoanalytic world? Well, I just enjoyed talking with you. It's so, you know, knowing you has made it easier and it's helped me kind of formulate some of my thoughts. And, it, it, you know, just personally, you know, um, I was, you know, I came of age in the 60s and was very involved in political things in the 60s and 70s and other periods of my life I've been active. And it's sort of, you know, even though it's, uh, oh, it's overwhelming what's going on. There is a kind of, okay, you know, w- you know, what's this last chapter of my life going to be like? And it's, it's, it's a gift to be able to return to some of these things and try to see them through further at this point. Uh, so, you know, uh, I have a, yeah, there's been a personal benefit to it. Uh, and I think it's it's galvanized psychoanalysis too, in a way that can be invigorating and uh, help psychoanalysis um, make itself, keep itself relevant uh, for society going forward. 
Great. Well, thank you very much mm, for your I've, honesty and openness mm, and thoughtfulness about uh, all these complicated um, and difficult issues. Um, and uh, uh, I wish you a lot of luck uh, with all of this. Thank you, Anna. And I wish you well, too, in, in terms of your work. And I, we didn't talk as much as we might have about that, but maybe another time. And I long to today we can meet in person. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, maybe I can blow you a kiss, you know, so Very <laughs> without, without risking infection. Okay. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye.